when I divide when I divide the Nasdaq by Bitcoin, Nasdaq's down ninety nine point nine seven percent. You just <laughs> own the strongest Nasdaq. If everything oh is God. correlated and driven by the same forces, you end up with a logical conclusion, which is you only need to own one asset, which is crypto, which is bizarre. And then the game is okay, which crypto is out outperforming? You do charts of anything versus Bitcoin and anything versus Ethereum. And if anything looks like it's breaking out versus those, that was Sol. So now my job is to look at anything versus Solana. Yeah. But Solana's a big project. So if it's, if it's a small thing, maybe WIF or one of the memes, I'll have a yeah. small position, but I won't put my life savings into it. But Solana's big enough, has big enough network adoption effects for me to say that's fine. Raul Pal, the CEO of Real Vision, is extremely bullish on crypto this cycle. And here's why. When comparing the Nasdaq to Bitcoin, he notes that the Nasdaq has underperformed Bitcoin by 99.97%. This highlights Bitcoin's significant outperformance relative to traditional stock indices. Given that various assets are correlated and driven by the same macroeconomic forces, Powell suggests that investors should focus on owning the strongest performing asset. For him, the perfect asset is crypto, specifically Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Solana. Meanwhile, an article on WatcherGuru predicts that Solana could boost its price following the recent filing by ARK21 shares and Vanek for a potential spot ETF. The filings have increased market confidence in Solana. CoinCodex predicts a gradual price increase for SOL, potentially reaching $170 by August 1, 2024. However, the prediction also suggests a slight dip in price before a significant surge past the $150 mark after mid-July. With that being said, let's take a look at some clips from Raul Pell's interview. Stop. You don't have time. Don't miss out this 2025 bull run. Educate yourself first ahead of the crowd. We have created the ultimate step-by-step -step crypto cheat guide that will guide you this bull run. Unlock the secrets of crypto and make smarter investments today. Now by clicking on the link below to get your exclusive copy just under $10. So the banana zone, the bananas are currently green on the tree, but they're ripening. Normally what we see is in the US election years, um, the banana zone starts sometime in the summer, sometimes as late as September, but I think it's starting now. I think crypto price is based uh, this week and that we should start to see stronger prices going forwards. The banana zone then should accelerate before the US election, that it probably usually pauses a bit while people get confused over the election, see what happens, and then things go really crazy towards the end of the year. So the banana zone is fully in play for me. People just need to have patience. The world has too much debt. In 2008, we broke the world. Most of the uh, governments around the world got to 100% of GDP in debt, and the banking system failed. We reset interest rates to zero back then, and everybody reset all of their debts on this kind of three to five year um, debt refinancing cycle. Now, there's not enough GDP to cover the debts from the private sector and the public sector. So what we found from 2008 onwards, the major central banks just printed money via liquidity, whether it's quantitative easing or other measures. And that printing of money helps pay the interest on the debts. Now, when you print money, you actually debase the money. And when you debase the money, it optically makes asset prices look like they're rising because you're lowering the denominator. So we see every four years this cycle where they begin to, to year three, they're starting to add liquidity. Year four, they're really adding liquidity. Year five of the debt cycle, they're still adding liquidity. And then they slow down again, and the cycle keeps repeating. So we get this three-year of liquidity that rises all assets, but particularly long-duration assets like crypto and technology. So that is the powerful super force behind almost all assets. There's a 97.5% correlation between the NASDAQ and this mechanism of liquid adding liquidity. Crypto is about 87.5% correlation. It's got less correlation because it keeps having these massive exponential moves. So what I did is looking at that, I realized, okay, we're actually getting poorer by 8% a year, which is the global debasement rate. That's the increase in global liquidity from the major central banks. And therefore, that was our hurdle rate on asset prices plus the rate of inflation. Let's say global inflation is 4% for easy numbers. So that's 
we need to make in our investments before we even break even. If not, our future self is poorer because we're not being able to own enough assets in the future because asset prices go up. We don't make enough out of our investments to offset the debasement. So I divided all assets by the global liquidity and found there's only two assets that actually outperform it. The rest don't go anywhere. And the two assets are technology stocks because they're in a secular bull market. Tomorrow is more digital than today. And crypto, which is the fastest adoption of any technology the world has ever seen. So that's what I base my everything code cycle on. It allows us to understand how prices move over time. It even potentially allows us to forecast prices in advance if we can forecast these liquidity flows because we know what they're refinancing. So it seems a ridiculously easy framework, and it probably is, but it seems to be working. So I'll go with that for now. Powell believes that the banana zone typically starts in U.S. election years, usually around summer to September, but he thinks it is starting now. This period is characterized by increasing crypto prices leading up to the U.S. election, with a potential pause during the election, followed by even crazier price movements towards the end of the year. He also notes the importance of patience for crypto investors. The market often attracts those seeking quick returns, but Powell urges investors to have a long-term perspective and understand the bigger picture. Now, let's get back to Raul Powell's interview. I didn't take profits last cycle, and I didn't want to because I found that just holding over time, even though it feels dramatic, holding over time and adding when it sells off actually is the way to compound wealth. If you've gone in a bull market from one to 10, and then it falls 80%, you won't put 10 back in. You won't because you're more risk adverse. And you're like, I can't lose everything, right? Your mind will play tricks with you. So you just leave it in and just say, okay, I've got a longer term time horizon. But for those people who want to cash in some lifestyle chips or de-risk, then, you know, you use some time like the end of the year, beginning of next year, you cash in a bit of money and then just ride the rest. Now, does it peak early? We don't know. Does it peak towards the end of the year like it's done in every cycle? Possibly. Do we have a blow off top? Possibly. I don't know. We can't really tell. So you need to set yourself up in advance where you, you're not hoping for the blow off top. You've taken some money off. And if it does blow off top, you can take some more off. If not, you just keep running it. I would say if you're under the age of 30, you should do, or under the age of like 35 or something, you should do nothing. Unless you've got enough there that taking 25% off can buy you a house or something life-changing that secures your life and ratchets you to a new living standard. If not, you should do nothing. You should just be thinking, how can I buy more when it sells off? To get the adoption curve completed, you need to be at like 4 billion people. So right now, crypto as an asset class is $2.5 trillion. If I just use the log regression channel of Bitcoin and just project out the growth rates of crypto versus the internet and assume it slows down massively from here, it gets to $100 trillion by about 2032. Now, $100 trillion, we throw around numbers like $100 trillion. Yeah. You've got to understand, $100 trillion, we're creating $97.5 trillion of new wealth. That is the most, the largest generation of wealth in the shortest period of time in all recorded human history. When you understand that the S&P 500 is a $50 trillion market cap, and that took 100 years of value accretion by the US economy and those companies, this is double that. We've never seen anything like it. So it's an extraordinary opportunity. Now, of that 100 trillion, will Bitcoin be 50% dominant in that market? No, because to get to 100 trillion, we have to be using the whole blockchain infrastructure for things like the finance system, for Web2 businesses, for all of the other elements, not just the moneyness element or the store of wealth element that Bitcoin has. So if the world were 100 trillion, what is the value of Bitcoin in that? Maybe it's 20 trillion. Maybe it's 15 trillion, whatever that number is. So it's the overall space that's going to see the growth. If it is the fastest accumulation of wealth in all history, it will attract all sorts of people. Now, when you talk about the gold rush in California, there was these wildcat miners, there was the scams, the crooks. We see it in the oil and gas business. We see it 
in the gold business. We see it on the internet everywhere. The Nigerian print scam is just because the internet allows money to move more freely. So of course we're going to see it in this space and it's very difficult to avoid it. Whenever there's a large increase in money available, you get criminality. We see it in China. We see it everywhere where there's access to new money. It has bad actors. That's always the case. And that's what regulation needs to be for. That's what you know, we need to get better about dealing with. We're just so far behind being able to deal with these kinds of people so far. But the great thing about the on-chain world is everything is trackable and traceable. We can figure it out. Pal acknowledges the influx of institutions through mechanisms like ETFs and questions who else could enter the market to drive Bitcoin's price higher. He speculates that Bitcoin could reach $150,000 this cycle but wonders which larger players might push it to $300,000 or even $1 million in the future. Pal projects that the cryptocurrency market could reach $100 trillion by 2032, using a logarithmic regression channel and comparing crypto growth to the internet's expansion. He underscores the enormity of this projection by contrasting it with the $50 trillion market cap of the SANP 500, which took 100 years to achieve. For more Daily Dose crypto news, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.